Hello everybody, I'm Nick and in this video I want to talk about JSON Web Tokens. As I was going through my main series, my next video will be about uh, authorization authentication, actual authentication first. And uh, I, I'm talking about JWTs, JSON Web Tokens, but I never actually really explain what they are. I just say they're tokens you pass around. And I can understand that you might not know what the concept is and what these tokens are and what they do and why we use them and why they're very, very powerful. So I want to make this video before I release my next video so you know what it is and what it's doing. I put a work on board and I can actually draw now. Initially I wanted to do a presentation but it looked too much like you being in uni. I hate that type of thing. So let's try this and if it works please recommend our topics and I'm going to make videos about them. So JWTs. Let's take a little bit back and let's see what we do currently. So let's say we have a huge monolithic CMS here. And it, you know, it's just an instance of it running. That's a very common scenario, it still happens. And then we have our user, and our user wants to access the website and authenticate. What would happen is this server keeps session slash state for this user. And this user keeps a cookie, which this server issues to him. Uh, so it can send it back with every request and um, recognize who this guy is. This is a nice concept, but what would happen if we wanted to scale out our application? You know, this CMS. Well, if I had a cluster here, so I move this in a cluster, and then I have a traffic manager. And this traffic manager works on load balancing. Uh, so based on how many requests and which one of these services has more load, it will redirect traffic around. If one request goes here and one request goes here, my auth request only went to this server here. This server doesn't know anything because it doesn't have this state about me. So I'm logged out here, but I'm logged in here. That's not nice. And it can actually not work. In this scenario, we'd have to use an authentication server and then they would have to communicate with the auth server. Yeah, but this is how we used to do things. In REST APIs, however, one of the core principles of the standard is that they're stateless. This means that they keep no state for the requests that are coming in or the users or anything. And every single request must be completely self-contained so we can achieve statelessness. So if I, if I have this now, which is, you know, API, API, and API, and then these are in a cluster, and again, I have a traffic manager here which is load balancing my service and my requests are found out across many services it doesn't matter in which server my request ends up because my request has a JWT token in the header and every time this is coming in these services don't really need to hit any service to authenticate this user they just check the signature of the JWT and we're gonna see what the signature is and just by making sure that the signature is authentic the token is authentic and we can trust everything in the JWT so let's see how a JWT is made a JWT consists of three parts the header the payload and the signature all the header is is a JSON object specifying uh, some things about authentication. So token authentication, I'm gonna show you what this is. This is also JSON object and it has all the claims, uh, which claims are just values that our server can use and ensure they're authentic through the signature, which is a hash. All of them are base 64 encoded so base 64, base 64, base 64, and they're separated by a dot. So how does a JWT actually look like? It looks like this. So we have our header here, which you can see it's JSON object specifying the algorithm and the type of the token. Then we have the payload, which is this, and it has some uh, data in it, it can, you can get the subject, and you can get the name of the user in this case and when this expires and that's issued at date actually. And you can have expiry dates here as well. And here we also have the way the signature is constructed. So the way it's built is 
a base64 URL encode of the header, base64 URL encode of the payload, so this and this, separated by a dot, and then we hash that in this case with this algorithm. And the algorithm is also specified in the header, so we know how to actually uh, authenticate this. And as you can see, this is a secret. We also use a secret. Now, let me show you something here, now that we know how they look like. In a realistic microservices REST API scenario, we would have the following. We would have the auth server. Let me just make this better, which is a auth API, let's say. And then we had anything else, let's say our post service. This service is handling, you know, the posts. And that's a post API. Obviously, people that post stuff need to be authenticated here to know who actually posts them and, you know, check if they have enough permissions. So if I'm a user here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my username and password to register and then log in. And this server will give me back a JWT. And it's going to be signed and ready. I don't need to do anything about it. All I need to do is store it on my phone. And with every request I make to the POST API, I need to include this to the header. That's all we do. How do they know that this is authentic? Well, in the scenario we showed, they actually have a secret, which these services share, but it's not in here. It's not anywhere in the user's domain. It's very hidden from him. And in fact, sometimes we're using certificates to create uh, potentially RSA uh, encryption for our tokens, but HS is uh, the most common one, so we're going to go with that for now. But there are many ways to do that. So how do they authenticate this then? Well, all they're going to do is use the secret they have and then get the first and the second part of the, um, essentially the same process. So if, if the server has this, so if, if the server has this secret here, they can just use it to hash, again, the header and the payload. And if the hash is match, then we know it's authentic. So they just validate this as if it was password. But if anything in here, let's say the first name changes, you can see that the signature also changes. Do you see that? And that's because the body of the payload is changing and the signature is made by the body and the header. So if the payload was to have something different, our signature would be invalid because this thing is not the outcome of a hash of these two. In fact, this is not even base, uh, valid base 64. Does it make sense? So as long as, and that's also true uh, with the header. So if I change, you know, this to none, for example, well, now we have nothing, but uh, I think it's a way to specify an algorithm that is not really a valid algorithm. Now let's just say this one. This also changes the signature because again, encryption is changed. If, if I change this, then my signature changes as well. So, what really happens is we are validating our tokens because we have this little secret here in both of our services here and that's all we need to have. And then this ensures that the body of JWT, what's in here in the payload, was actually sent by our auth API, our auth server. We can trust it if it's not expired, of course. It's very important to understand that this method of encoding a token is not encrypting it. The payload, you can just paste it in any, you know, base64 decryptor and get the content of it. So you're not meant to have like passwords or, secu you know, secure data in it, but just enough data for the API to use to do its operation. So in this case, the user ID, potentially the user email and stuff like that. Keep in mind that this is a universal type of uh, authentication, meaning in here, you don't only have to have username and password, you can have also Facebook, 
you can have Google, you can have Instagram, you can have any type of authentication. You can get a JWT back from this. So you can have many things coming back to a single thing you're using. So in the next video, we're going to see how we actually can generate this JWT in .NET Core and how we can use it to authenticate to a REST API on every request. So stay tuned for that. Please leave a like if you like this video. Give feedback on this whiteboarding type thing and subscribe for more videos if you like this video. Keep coding.